I want to share with you this morning, what is the Holy Spirit like? What's he like? We know what the Bible says about him. We know who he is. We know that he's the part of God's beautiful holy trinity, that he is the, the person of God. We know that he dwells in our hearts by faith. We know that without him, we cannot be born again. He's the, the, the person of God in the regeneration of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that we are, are born again uh, through not a corruptible seed, but the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God and that lives and abides forever. See, when I was born naturally, I was born by my father's seed. That's a corruptible seed. I'll die through that seed. But when I'm born of the seed of God, I'll live forever. See, I'll live forever because I'm born of God. You're born of God today. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit to bring about the creation, the recreation of God in your heart through the regeneration, through the Holy Ghost, through the new birth, that you might be born again, that you might be born not of the will of man, but born of God. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the comforter. He is he's a comforter and therefore he cares about your emotional welfare because a lot of the problems we have in our life, it's because we are, are, have emotional needs. And it, it's, it's more different to spiritual strength. It's direct comfort to your soul as a present uh, comfort. Like a, a, a child after a fall will need help to, to be embraced and to be cuddled and to care for if a child comes home and He's had a hard day at school. She's had a hard day at school. The Holy Spirit is like a, a parent and a, a friend. When you're helpless as a child in your adult years and cannot help yourself, that's who the Holy Spirit is. He is the, the comforter, the comforter, the one who takes care of me. See, many years ago we were taught that the soulish area was to be mitigated and the spiritual life had the preeminence. I think it's true the spiritual life does have preeminence. But what about these attributes that God has given to us, the attribute of the mind? When so many people are troubled in their mind, so many people are troubled in their thoughts and people are troubled with memory, people are troubled with uh, emotions and people can't, get control over their emotions. People have gone through grief and they need comfort. There's only one thing that a person that's gone through grief and a person needs in a time of need is, is comfort. And I, I believe that we need to emulate everything that God is. We need to know God and to emulate everything that God is. And I think, you know, one of the greatest things we can be as a Christian, um, one of the greatest things we can be and one of the greatest things we can do is comfort people in a time of need. You know what I mean? I mean we were taught years ago, oh, there's a verse here. Just give the people the word. Give them scriptures. Hit them with the Bible. You know what I mean? And we were raised that way in church. I don't know. It's probably good for the day. I mean, it was a big church, so it must have been working. You know, sometimes people just need someone to sit with them. Sometimes just people need a little bit of time. Sometimes people need your time. Your children need your time. And that's, that's love, you know. And, 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 and the Holy Spirit manifests love. The Bible says actually the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And so this is the work of the Holy Spirit to actually bring the love of God through our hearts to people. And this is the greatest commandment, that we'd love God and that we'd love our neighbour as ourselves, and that we would love one another. A new commandment, Jesus said, I give unto you that you love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, by the love that you have for one another. And this is the work, you know, you can't really love people with God's love without the Holy Spirit because it's the work of the Holy Spirit to actually manifest the love of God through your heart. And by this, you know, we find that we're able to love people that we can't always normally love. And we can love sometimes unlovable people. I'm very uh, lucky with you. What's a terrible word? You know, you can get stoned for using the word lucky as a, in church. Um, you're blessed, you see. But um, I'm very blessed to have a, a, a kind church. I mean, there's no one unlovely. Is, is anyone unlovely sitting next to you this morning? 
See, no, that, that proves that I'm saying what I'm right. I'm right what I'm saying. Everyone's loved here. So everyone's easy. So it's easy. It's easy because, but, but when someone is not lovely, then God can give you love for, for people that are unlovely, people that are difficult. Um, and we find in life that God will always bring someone unlovely and someone difficult around our life at different times. It, it will happen. Uh, I'm not a gambling man, but I say you can bet on it. And you never say that in church because you could be stoned by elderships. Um, but the Holy Spirit, Jesus revealed as a comforter. And we need comfort in our life. We need comfort in a time of grief. And the Holy Spirit will be to you like a parent, a friend, when you're as helpless as a little child, when you don't know what to do, when something's happening in your life that's out of reach. The Holy Spirit is the arm of God around you in your day of need. He will give you the strength to do what you can't do. He will wipe away your tears. His primary emotion, and the Holy Spirit does have an emotion, his primary emotion is joy. That's the emotion of the Holy Spirit. The Bible describes him, as you well know, he's our advocate, he's our helper, he's the wind of God, the breath of God, he's the oil of God that represents healing, he's the fire of God that brings power. And we know, as the scripture says, that he's anointing, which is the endowment of his spirit that's upon our life, that his anointing abides. The Holy Spirit will manifest himself in every part, in every need, in every time. Commune with him. Commune with the Holy Spirit. Commune with him. David knew that the Holy Spirit was someone to know, that he was someone to be sought after, that he was someone to commune with. What does it mean to commune? Pretty much what it says. Commune, talk, know, communicate, fellowship. Has anyone got any better words? For commune, if you have, you can stand up if there's something more articulate you feel that you could say there, but communing with him, communing, learning to commune with God who lives in your heart. He lives in your heart by faith. This is the Holy Spirit. This is what the psalmist David had to say from Psalm 4. You can read it with me if you like. I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible. He says this in Psalm 4. You can turn there. It just takes a minute to turn there. Psalms. Proverbs, they're the sort of two Old Testament sort of books we read the most, aren't they? The Psalms and the Proverbs. And But I just like what David says here, and it's always spoken to me, this passage of Scripture. He says, it says, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. You know, God has the ability to, to somehow expand you where you need expanding in the day that you're in distress, when you call upon him, and his prayer was this, have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. I shared last Wednesday that mercy is the greatest prayer that anyone can pray. The moment you cry mercy, and it's the cry of mercy, it's not the prayer of mercy, but the cry of mercy. When Jesus stood still, it was always for the cry of mercy. And it's more of the, the desperation cry in a time of need. It's the cry of mercy because we can pray prayers and sometimes we, we feel that we sometimes haven't sort of really reached God with our heart in some of the things we said. But it's the cry. God answers the cry more than what he answers the prayer. And David, he's troubled, he's perplexed and he, he needs expansion. He says, God, oh God of my righteousness, you have enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me in him I pray. This isn't just a prayer this is the cry and now look in verse 2 it says oh sons of man how long will you turn my glory into shame how long will you how long will you love vanity and seek after leasing and i thought what's this word leasing the word leasing means to 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 seek after you know people of high degree you know what i mean to, to seek for someone who's perhaps got greater sort of uh intelligence or sort of political power or someone who's in the know who can do something for you and you can reach that person because that person can help fulfill your agenda. I'll 
tell you something, if there's a time of need, you always come to God in prayer first. Always come to God in prayer first. And allow him to expand you, allow him to do something because God has the ability to do something when you don't know what to do. And I'll tell you something, when you've been a Christian for a few years, you know what to do. You've learned what to do. You've learned how to reach God. But what about when something's happened that you don't know what to do? And the Bible is saying here, watch your heart that you don't seek after leasing. But look at this, verse 3 says, But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Now I want you to take this personal because you know that God will hear when David cries unto him, when Solomon cries unto him, when Moses cries unto him, when Abraham cries unto him, when Adam cried unto him, when all the sons of God would cry unto him, when Jesus would cry unto him. But God says, the Lord will hear when I cry to him. You see, when I call upon him, he will hear me. And the most important prayer in the universe is the prayer that you're praying to God now. That's the most important prayer. You know, I often say the most important person in the world is the person that you're talking to in the room now. That's the most important person in the world, the person that you're you're with, the one you're talking with. What's the most important time? It's the time that I'm spending with the person now. But the Lord will hear me. He says in verse 4, he says, Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Silah, which means to pause and take note and to recognize what this passage of Scripture is saying. That's what silah means. It means embrace it, grab it, watch it, listen to it, take hold of it, stand in awe and sin not. See, you might want to get mad. You might want to get mad with someone. But the Bible says, stand in awe sin, and commune with God upon your own bed and be still. Commune. There's a place when you can lie in your bed. And the Bible says that there's a time to kneel, there's a time to stand, there's a time to shout. And here's a time to lie in your bed and commune with God from your bed. Isn't this amazing? That God is going to meet you in a time when you commune with him upon your own bed and it's not a time to be standing and shouting praise. It's a time to be still, to rest and allow God to meet you in your time of rest. Now, it says in verse 5 now, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. You know, I'll tell you something, the fact that we gathered around the Lord's table this morning means that we've already done that. We've offered the sacrifices of righteousness and we right now through that, we've already put our trust in the Lord. There should be many that will say, There'll be many that will make questions and look at you and say, well, who will show us any good? And the response here is, Lord, lift up, your, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. For thou hast put, now look at this, I want you to see the attribute of the Holy Spirit here. For thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time of their corn and their wine increased. And the corn and the oil and the wine always spoke about the times of God's blessing of prosperity of the people's labours for the Israelites. And look at verse 8 says, it says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for you, Lord, only call me to dwell in safety. So there's a wonderful promise for you, that God will cause you to dwell in safety. If you've got problems around your house, God will cause you to dwell in safety. You know what I'm saying? Um, so this is a wonderful thing. And this is the time where God says he will meet you upon your own bed and you can commune with God in the place of rest. This isn't a, a prayer meeting. This is your fellowship with God. You see, you need to understand that the Holy Spirit is not God's appointed police officer to you. He wishes to guide you more than correct you. His guidance comes as you move in faith. Guidance from God's Spirit always comes as you move in faith. You know, it's a little bit like Remember the old days in cars before they had power steering? Uh, we had a, an XB Falcon and it had no power steering and we had no air conditioning and I would travel out to, to uh, country towns and 
One day this young fella said, I'm going to give you an air-conditioned seat mat. I thought, oh, this sounds pretty good. And what it was, it was like a, a, a vented sort of cushion. It was like a nylon vented cushion. You know how nice it is to sit in something nylon on a really hot day? <laughs> and it was like one of those web nylon seats and, and had two fan motors, one each side there. And you plug it into your cigarette lighter. Do you remember how your cigarette lighters used to come in cars? Now we have power outlets. But they used to be cigarette lighters. So I plugged this thing in and had two fans and it blew uh, cold air up my back. And I, you know, I thought that was pretty good. And uh, someone said, you better do something about that car. So I, I hammered around the quarter panel, I, I hammered the rust in. And I got a whole lot of newspaper. And I, and I shoved that in and then I, I got some bog and I, I bogged it over and I had a sand and my dad gave me a sand and I had a sand this and I sanded it all off and then I went down to Repco and I got some touch-up paint. It's called Mushroom Beige, that XB Falcon. And I spray-painted that corner and I spray-painted the bonnet with Mushroom Beige. So I went into town and to preach the gospel, I'd look respectable. <laughs> but in saying that, you see, the, the steer, there's no power steering. And so when you try to turn... Remember you'd try and turn the steering wheel on the old cars before power steering, and it was hard to turn. But once the car got rolling, it's, it's a lot easier to turn. And it's sort of, that's a little bit like our life. You know, sometimes, you know, I've, I've got friends that have been waiting 20 years for God to move, you know. And, and they, they're really good guys, and they, they're lovely people. They're great people, really warm-hearted, great people. And they're saying, David, I just know God's going to move, you know. And I was friends with them in, in America years ago and we set up a youth work there in Louisiana and, and we had a great friends, I mean historical relationships, you can't replace them. And they're waiting for God to move and, and, but you know you have to start moving in God and start listening to what God's telling you to do and start moving in the things that God tells you to do and then it's sort of like as, as, the, as the car starts to roll forward the steering wheel becomes a lot lighter and you'll find that Guidance from God's spirit comes as you move in faith and you'll start to roll with the plan of God for your life. But you've got to start stepping out and just doing a few things. It might be love your neighbour, um, whatever you have to do. I've got my own problems so you can sort your problems out. But if he wishes to guide you more than correct you. His guidance comes as you move in faith. He will lead you in the way that is fitting and right for you as the will of God always brings exceeding joy. And this is the measure of the Spirit's communication, for the Holy Spirit himself is the joy of the Lord. He is the one who brings great gladness of heart. He is completely and utterly reliable, dependable and trustworthy. The moment you call out to Jesus, the Holy Spirit immediately brings his own reassurance to your life. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. I'm a communicator this morning of because oh, I'm communicating the Bible and this Bible message, but the Holy Spirit is the teacher. So how does God work through the Holy Spirit and the Word? So here's the Word. How many people know the Bible but yet they don't believe in God? How many people are in Bible lectures today and it's well renowned in certain denominations that there are professional Bible lecturers in Christian universities who have no faith in God at all? And they do, they do it as an academic profession and they are carried doctorates of divinity and Bible teaching. But they are not people who have personal faith, it is their occupation, it's, it's incomprehensible. I don't understand it. I remember a priest, a priest, well, there's a few different kinds of priests, but this priest was telling me that his student said, you know, how do I, how do I communicate with this fellow who doesn't even believe God? He said, oh, well, it'll just toughen you up, won't it? Well, I, I don't understand it. I don't, I can't follow that school of thinking. How does the Holy Spirit teach me? As we speak the word of God, the word goes out. Now we can see a seen realm here, but there's also an unseen realm. There is the realm. How many people believe that there is a realm of God, a realm of the Holy Spirit in your heart and over your life? I tell you how the Holy Spirit teaches you. I will take words 
and it'll go into the realm of the Holy Spirit over your life and it'll come back into your ears as an anointed word and sink down into your heart and that's how the Holy Spirit teaches you. And so no man can teach you. Jesus said, no man can teach you for every man will know God for himself. Why? Because the Holy Spirit becomes his teacher. So he will teach you the word of God so that you will know God after his word in truth. He continues to dwell in my heart by faith. I can commune with the Holy Spirit without making a request for the purpose of knowing him and feeling him and I need to feel the Holy Spirit. I, I have to feel him. I have to feel the Holy Spirit. Oh, can you feel the Holy Spirit? Often of a Wednesday, I can just feel the Holy Spirit. I can feel his presence, often right standing here. You know what sometimes I say, come and stand. I want to stand here. And someone says, stand I want you to come and stand here. And they step back. And they please come and stand here. I can feel the Holy Spirit here. So I step back and I pray. I say, oh, Holy Spirit, touch in there. You see, you've been in these meetings. You know what God does. I can feel the Holy Spirit. I can feel places, spots. I've felt spots of the devil. I went into a church in South Africa where a, a pastor had been murdered and I stood in the very spot where they found his body and I've been in homes where evil spirits have been manifesting and I could walk through that home and I could say, you've got problems right here. And because there's cold spots, the Holy Spirit produces joy spots, hot spots, good spots. The devil produces evil cold spots. Remember that little girl that came to the church? She said, oh, thank you. That's the man. She was talking about me. I was the man for the moment. But that was the man that drove the ghost out of our home. I was horrified, very frightened as a child because there was an evil presence uh, not too far from where I lived. It frightened me so much that I couldn't sleep in my teenage years. It caused me horrific fear. And I think, God, aren't you amazing to think that 15 years later that I'm visiting homes and I'm picking up a coffee on the way and... As I'm coming back to church, I'm still finishing that coffee. But isn't God amazing? Isn't God amazing how he will take away the things that frighten you and cause you the greatest fear? And, you know, I think about little children, about the work of what the Holy Spirit can do in little children. You know how little children are afraid of the dark? And, you know, I remember as a little boy going to bed and I'd sort of I'd keep one eye open because I thought I could see shadows moving, you know, and... And it took a bit to get me to sleep, but you know, fortunately little kids tend to fall asleep pretty quickly, but a lot of little children grow up with a lot of fears. And um, I don't know, maybe it's some of the storybooks we read to them or, you know, I, I, I don't know. You know, rock a -bye baby in the treetop when, the, when tree, the, the cradle will fall and down will come baby, cradle and all. What a wonderful thing to, to sing to a kid before they go to sleep. How we but you know what's wonderful is that you, you can make you, you can commune with the Holy Spirit without asking the Holy Spirit to do anything for you. Have you ever thought about Holy Spirit? I I really want to do something for you today because I know that you're in my heart. I know that you're primarily a comforter, and. I just know someone that needs a little comfort today and, and I'm going to be like God. I'm going to be God to that person that needs comfort today. And when I go down and visit that person, Lord, I just thank you that you're going to manifest your own comfort through me to that person so I'll be God to that person today. Like Moses was God to the children of Israel, then you can be God to the people that are in need around your life because of the work of the Holy Spirit in you and you can emulate those attributes of comfort to people that are in need around your life. I can commune with the Holy Spirit without making any kind of requests upon him. And this is a relationship. You imagine a relationship whereby I said to Phil, 
I think I only do talk to Phil when I ask him for something, but let's say if I didn't ask him for something and I just talked to him because I wanted to just talk to Phil, you know, and he could talk to me, but we don't have to make any sort of demand or request upon each other, you know, we can, we can commune. We can commune with each other and there's no request, there's no demand, there's, oh, by the way, you know, can you do something? I, have, I, do that, I do that a lot because there's always something that has to be done. But generally speaking, I like to be able to just talk with people and relate to people without making a demand or a request. And I think this is the greatest kind of level of fellowship that we can have with God through the Holy Spirit, that we can talk to the Holy Spirit and commune with the Holy Spirit and, and allow the Holy Spirit time to work his own impressions into her heart and those impressions are never forgotten so I, I, I need to feel God Mary put her hand up and she said I can feel goosebumps all over my body that's God, that's the Holy Spirit and God's doing something because he's manifesting his presence on your life and I felt God manifest something on Andrew here Wednesday and I prayed for him and God touched him and I hope your shoulder's getting better how much better is it now than what it was a lot better because you were holding your arm, weren't you, in pain. And I said, look, we'll just come up in the church and we'll pray for you. It was after the meeting. And I, thought, I know God's with them. Now, I don't, I pray for them, but I can sort of, I don't have to worry about them because I know God's with them. And so, so um, Catherine Kuhlman, she would spend up to eight hours at the Pittsburgh Hilton Hotel on the top level, on the top floor. I've seen the Pittsburgh Hilton and the pastor I train with he said, oh, David, that's where Catherine Coleman spent the time. She spent up to eight hours a day in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if you Google up, Google up Catherine Coleman videos, um, she was testifying. She said, oh, I think she was in Las Vegas. Las Vegas is a, is a funny place to hold a Christian meeting because, I mean, it's a, it's a party atmosphere. It's a gambling atmosphere. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's just 24-hour um, weddings. You know, it's just do what you want. It's a fantastic place to visit. It really is. It's you know what I mean? Uh, we went to uh, Gold and Silver. You know uh, the, the Channel 7 series uh, where they change their gold and silver and it's called uh, P-A-W-N stars. And, uh, and I, I got a photograph there and, and I was happy to meet the guys. They have more people come through there than the Hoover Dam. And that's how popular that television series is. And, um, but Catherine Kuhlman, she, she, would spend, she would spend up to eight hours just in the presence of God. And she, she said down at Las Vegas, she said, oh, she said, God's doing something amongst the wheelchairs. Something's happening amongst the wheelchairs. And all of a sudden there was a clatter and a clung and people just started coming out of wheelchairs. And that's all she said. And you know something, when you hear, when you hear her preach, she doesn't sort of really say a whole lot, really. Yeah, she, that's, that's it. She, she just says, oh, oh, God's doing this. Okay. And then she'll, she'll just move as God shows her. And she... she when I've heard her preach, it's like she hasn't really preached. She, she just says, she just says things, and, and they happen as she says them. And they reckon, you know, she always almost sounds a little bit mystical when she talks. You know what I mean? And and I sort of, it's almost well, you have to sort of get used to the way she talks. But apparently, she wouldn't even come out on stage unless she had a particular dress and even the right lipstick. She, she was a lady, wasn't she? You know what I mean? And 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 that that's how she was. That's how this that's how this lady Catherine Coleman was. And 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 um and then and then Smith Wigglesworth had this to say in page 111 in his big green book, he said, he said, the secret of the future is living and moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. The infilling of the Holy Spirit is the perfect will for you. There's no greater will than the infilling of the Holy Spirit. He is the perfect he he, he is he is the perfect spirit. And he is the perfect spirit of God as God's armour is perfectly fitting for you, then the Holy Spirit is the one that's right for your heart. As God's armour, which is a perfectly fitting armour, is right for you, then the Holy Spirit is perfectly fitting for you. You need the Holy Spirit because he is the promise of the Father and he is the prayer that Jesus prayed for you when Jesus prayed in John 14, verse 16, that I may pray to the Father that he may give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Why would Jesus pray that we would need another comforter? Because Jesus was on this earth as God and he was the comforter to all men. He was the comforter, the healer, the deliverer and he was a saviour to all men and he said, you're going to need the comforter. And he said in John 16 verse 7, he said, stay with me now, he says, nevertheless I tell you the truth, it's expedient that I ascend for if I ascend, 
and the Holy Spirit will descend and he will come unto you. That's exactly what he said in John 16 verse 7. And this is perfect for you that you would receive another comforter. John the Baptist said, In whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining, this is he which will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. The Holy Spirit is the voice of God. In 1 Kings 19 verse 12, he was described as being the still small voice. But is, is he always a still small voice? No, at that point of time he was a still small voice, but I don't think he's always a still small voice. I think he can make his purposes and intentions very clear and very loud. And I believe the Holy Spirit can do things in your life by pushing you into a corner so that you can't go any other way but to do his will. I remember I was fixing, back in many years ago, I was fi fixing a brake line to a diff axle, a diff housing. And the, the part came back, it was too long. It was about a foot too long. I don't know why they made it so long. The pipe had already been cut, had been flared, the, the nut was going on there to connect the wheel cylinders. I remember having to reshape this thing and I thought, oh God, I've had enough of this. And over a period of time, we were told to pray in this car park at five o'clock in the morning and I, I felt pushed into a corner like this. I felt like God pushed me into a corner. I thought, I can't do anything. I can't do anything, but if God was to bring me out of this corner, then I know I could come out of this corner. And he said to me, I'll take care of everything. That's what he said. I'll take care of everything. And that's, that's what he said to me. But you know his voice because it's unmistakable. His voice leaves an inward lasting impression that's unforgettable, unmistakable and so reinforcing. Pray in the Spirit more because the Apostle Paul said this, I thank God I pray in tongues more than you all. Pray in the Spirit. Romans 8 verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit itself helpeth us in our infirmities when we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself will make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. That's exactly what Romans 8 verse 26 says. And what Romans 8 verse 26 says is this, that when you don't know how to pray as you ought in your English understanding voice, then you pray in the Spirit. And when you pray in the Spirit, there are groanings which go up before God. There are groanings which cannot be uttered, the Bible says, and they go up before God. And Jesus, the Bible says in Hebrews 7 verse 25, ever lives to make intercession for us. So as we pray in the Spirit, there are groanings that go up before God. Jesus is able to interpret those groanings before the right-hand side of God and pray the perfect will to the Father so that when we pray in the Spirit, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are all at work together to bring all the counsels of God to pass in our life, in this human life on planet Earth. What does the Bible say in Romans 8 verse 31? If God be for us, who can be against us? I want you to know something. The Holy Spirit is living in your heart, not only just to stay there free of rent, but he's there to keep you connected with the Father and with the Son. That's why the Holy Spirit is residing in your heart by faith today. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 verse 18, to be filled with the Spirit. The Bible says to stay filled with the Spirit. The Bible tells us to believe God beyond your mind, but according to the infilling of His Spirit in your heart, so that you're always believing God in the power of your Holy Spirit from your heart. The heart is the vessel, the tool that God has told us to believe. For with the heart man believes, because the heart is bigger than the mind. The mind brings reasoning and limitations, but the heart believes. The heart expands. David said, God, enlarge me. What's he talking about? Enlarge, enlarge my heart. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress, Psalm 4 says. The Holy Spirit brings a beautiful... Listen to this now. This is nearly my closing point. The Holy Spirit brings a beautiful refinement to every emotional detail of your life. Do you want me to say that again? The Holy Spirit brings a beautiful refinement to every emotional detail of your life. He has the power to raise Jesus from the dead. Remember that when you pray, that the one who you're praying to and the one who's praying through you has the power to raise Jesus from the dead. Imagine what he can do to help you. And then my notes say, thank you, Jesus, on page six. And then I've written here, the Sunday, the 18th of December, 2016. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Uh, what is the Holy Spirit like? God bless you. I've shared my message with you now. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Nothing more to say.